I'll go back to that. When you hear the word Patagonia, what do you think? Puffy jackets? <laughs> Folks who look like they should be hanging off a cliff somewhere? Is that what you think? Or do you think of that wind-scoured region at the bottom of South America? And if you've been to Patagonia the place and experienced its wild beauty, its uh, splendor and extraordinary character in person, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm sure you have a story to tell. And I do too. And I wish, I very much wish it was about a grand and epic adventure, maybe something like the one experienced by my late boss, Douglas Tompkins, who uh, was part of the expedition in 1968 to Fitzroy. And you can see Doug Tompkins there with his, uh, his buddy, Yvonne Chouinard, who went to go on and have a little clothing company. He started up with a, a logo that has Fitzroy on it. And they, and three other buddies, spent five weeks hanging out in snow caves waiting for the weather to clear before they reached the summit. But my story of uh, Patagonia is far more prosaic, and I think that's okay. Actually, I think it's good that regular people like me and like you uh, that maybe aren't going to hang out uh, on vertical cliffs, we too can have deeply influential experiences in untrammeled landscapes untrammeled landscapes, places of beauty and integrity and wildness, places that are characteristic of the way all the world used to be, and maybe could be again, if our conservation movement becomes more bold and more effective. So once upon a time, not too long ago, I was hanging out here in the Chacabuco Valley of southern Chile. My hiking companions at the time were all very accomplished nature photographers, so for some reason they wanted to take pictures of that, <laughs> uh, which I benefit from. Uh, and I had most of the afternoon to myself, a time of silence and solitude with only the sound of the wind and birdsong, hiking through these grasslands that are teeming with wanacos and crossing through little patches of forest, which are strongholds of the endangered huemul, or South Andean deer. And then as dusk neared, the group reassembled and we threw our sleeping bags down on the ground and this is what appeared, this sky overhead. It was incredible because there was not another person or another human structure for many miles. And it was exciting to be in that place under that extraordinary skyscape, uh, but it was also exciting because we happened to have thrown our sleeping bags down on the ground in a place that is occupied by mountain lions. <laughs> and mountain lions are that region's top predator, and they're vitally important to healthy ecosystems, of course. And my scientist colleagues within Tompkins Conservation have uh, been conducting a long-running study of the interactions between mountain lions and huemul, so that specifically we can know whether the healthy population of large cats is negatively affecting the imperiled population of deer. So I've seen the data. I know what they eat. And they don't eat middle-aged hikers from Vermont. <laughs> I know that intellectually. But viscerally, <laughs> when you lay your sleeping bag down on the ground and the sun starts to go down and the shadows lengthen and you realize that maybe there is a mountain lion haunting those shadows, it gives you pause. But it also is the essence of a wilderness experience, a place to be where the land is self-willed, where it is not yoked to human desires to manipulate and control and extract, a land that is home to self-willed creatures, even creatures that maybe we find threatening, but that are left free to flourish in their own ways. So it was really a pleasure to be in that place and get through the night and then see the sunrise, that sunrise on San Lorenzo, to awake to that view. So what did I experience? Scenic splendor, muscle-powered recreation, the companionship of friends, uh, abundant wildlife, all the values associated with national parks going back some 150 years. And where exactly was I? I was in the future Patagonia National Park, which will forever be available to you 
and to your children and to all the people of the earth to experience these same qualities due to this recent agreement between Tompkins Conservation and the Chilean government. On March 15th of this year, Christine Tompkins, who heads Tompkins Conservation there with Chilean President Michelle Bachelet, announced, uh, and they were in Pumaline Park, our other flagship park project, farther, a bit farther to the north in the Chacabuco Valley. And there they gathered to announce the largest ever expansion of a national park system on Earth prompted by the donation of private land. In specifics, Tompkins Conservation pledged to give away essentially all of our privately assembled conservation lands in Chile, roughly one million acres, and all of the public access infrastructure that we have created at Pumaline Park and Patagonia Parks. And in turn, the government will be chipping in about nine million acres, upgrading some existing national reserves and adding some other government lands to the package. In some, creating five new national parks and expanding three existing national parks and adding more than 10 million acres to Chile's national park system. Now, one of the key goals of this project is to establish this so-called root of parks. Uh, this root of parks vision would cover 17 national parks between Puerto Montt and the Beagle Channel. And we envision this as an absolutely powerful tool for regional economic transformation as this becomes a globally known destination for adventure tourism and we see local economies benefit as a consequence of wilderness protection. Now this landmark deal that was just announced builds on a legacy uh, going back some 25 years. Doug and Chris Tompkins, after leaving very successful careers in the corporate world, turned their talents to saving nature. And even before this deal, Tompkins conservation efforts have already helped establish six new national parks in Chile and Argentina. And that park making work is complemented by probably the most ambitious program of rewilding in the Americas. Uh, where my colleagues in the um, Ibarra marshlands region of northern Argentina have already reintroduced various extirpated species, including giant anteaters, pompous deer, green-winged macaws, collared peccaries, tapirs, and other species, and we're now working to captive breed jaguars for eventual return into the future Ibarra National Park. So why focus on creating and rewilding national parks? Well, because they are the oldest, the most durable, and the most loved tool for per permanently protecting natural areas, as well as introducing people to the integrity and beauty and wildness of healthy landscapes. And buying land and donating it for public natural areas is not a new idea. The very first national park in Argentina is the result of a gift of private land to the state from Perito Moreno back in 1903. The first National Park in Ireland was a gift of private philanthropy. Iconic parks, Muir Woods, Grand Teton, Great Smoky Mountains, Virgin Islands National Park, many others, all either created or expanded from private philanthropy. And even in Chile, the kind of most iconic park in that nation, Torres del Paine, also a result, uh, not a result, but expanded through uh, private philanthropy when uh, the Italian mountaineer Guido Manzino donated his private estancia to expand the park in the 1970s. But this Tompkins and Bachelet government agreement, along with these earlier examples of national park creation uh, that have been executed by Tompkins Conservation in the past, with four different presidents of different political persuasions, I think really shows the power of public-private collaboration in this particular moment, when these challenges before us are so bold and so grave and demand bold thinking, and by creating big, wild national parks and demonstrating uh, organic farming and ranching practices outside those protected areas, helping to buffer them with sustainable agricultural use, Chris and Doug Tompkins and the Tompkins Conservation Team have offered the world a model for an engaged entrepreneurial philanthropy at an unprecedented scale. Now, we are engaged in this work for all the values that have been articulated through conservation history about protected areas. Experiential, utilitarian, economic, ecological, evolutionary, we get all those. 
But part of the reason why it's so fun to be part of the Tompkins conservation team is to say this. And here, um, I'm going to be very clear about something. We do this work not only to benefit local communities in southern Chile. We do this because fundamentally we believe wild places and wild creatures exist for their own sake. That is the ultimate argument for conservation, that these creatures exist on their own. They have intrinsic value. Uh, they do not require us to value them. When, and here I'm going to step aside from optimism for just a moment and have a little uh, pessimistic snark. When we heard in the plenary session this morning a representative of an international conservation organization say, we do not protect nature for its own sake, we do it for people, a perfectly repugnant statement, and my mouth hit the ground as my jaw dropped. I was shocked, and I'm pleased to say we do protect nature for its own sake, as well as for the sake of human economies and human welfare. Because we have an ethical obligation to be good neighbors in the community of life. If we take seriously this idea that Aldo Leopold articulated about the evolutionary odyssey, we know that we are not just metaphorical relatives to our wild kin. We are literally related. My daughter here is with her cousins, either nearer or more distantly related. So can national parks alone save the world? No, maybe not. But this evolving national park idea, as it embodies this notion of a commitment to be good neighbors in the community of life, is a crucial component of planetary healing. Individually, we know protected areas, national parks and other protected areas, protect habitats, sustain ecological and evolutionary processes, uh, sequester carbon, mitigate climate chaos, help local economies. We know all those things. And we know that collectively, if we think boldly enough, national parks and marine parks can be the anchors of interconnected systems of conservation lands that ultimately ring at least half the Earth and that can eventually slow and stop the global extinction crisis. And personally, when we visit them, when we experience national parks and other wild places, we know that they offer an invitation to us personally to help rewild ourselves as well as the Earth. They help rebut old narratives about dominion and control. And they offer a new story about communion and reciprocity. They're a place to remember our deepest longings for kinship and communion and connection. And in this deeply troubled world, public-private partnerships to expand national parks, driven by both passionate advocacy and innovative philanthropy, are a crucial means to achieving that future we seek, a future characterized by beauty, integrity, wildness, with freedom and habitat for all. Thank you.